Welcome to New Life Assembly of God Media Ministry. We are glad that you are here. We believe the Word of God is relevant and life-changing, and we hope you can be blessed by this message. We are continuing our Christmas series this morning. Don't miss Christmas. I encourage you, invite somebody next week for the Christmas service. Amen. Do you know this past week, the Lord put it on my heart. I was in different places, and three times the Lord put on my heart, invite that person. I was, I was getting my oil changed, and there was a lady sitting there, and she was all, like, closed down just with her arms like this. And the Lord said, invite her. And I thought to myself, Lord, she looks so close. She's not going to want to come, <laughs> you know. And the Lord just kept putting on my heart, invite her. And so I started up a conversation. Hey, how are you doing? Are you ready for the Christmas season, etc." Before you know it, she was pouring her whole life out to me. And so I was able to encourage her in the Lord. And then when they called her for her car, I said, hey, before you go, I just want to invite you to come for Christmas to our church. And she looked at me, and she said, wow. She said, you know, my sister is a Christian in Georgia. And I talked to her last week, and I said, I think I need God. I need to find a church in this area. And then here you come invite me today, you know. And then it happened again a couple other times at a restaurant or whatever where I handed them a card, invited them, and they said, you know what? I'm looking for a church. So, folks, people are ready. It's, the, the harvest is white. We just got to go out and invite them, amen? So take some of the invite cards out there. Invite somebody to join you for service on Christmas Sunday. This time of the year, they're most open to coming to the house of the Lord. And that's what we're here for, folks, is to introduce people to Jesus. So invite them to come so they can meet Jesus. And everybody said? That means so be it. That means you're going to do it. So don't make yourself a liar, amen? (laughs) So bring somebody next week, all right. Continuing our series, Don't Miss Christmas, if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Our uh, message this morning is titled, Defeating Disappointment, Defeating Disappointment. One Christmas, there was a lady named Lynn, and she shared the story how her husband put an assortment of beauty products in her stocking. And so uh, she opened up her stocking, and that day she decided she was going to try one of the items her husband gave her, a facial mask. And she was about, she had applied the mask, and she was about to wash it off when her eight-year-old son, Callum, walked into the bathroom and was shocked at how his mother looked. You know how those masks look, amen? Looks like some kind of monster, all right? And so she uh, allayed his fears and explained to him, oh, this was a gift from daddy, and I put it on my face because it's supposed to make me look more beautiful. (laughs) And so he patiently waited by his mother's side as she rinsed off her face and patted it dry with a towel. She turned to her son and she said, well, Callum, what do you think? And he, with shock on his face, said, Oh, Mom, it didn't work. (laughs) Callum was disappointed that the facial didn't make his mother more beautiful, and I'm sure she was disappointed with her son's response. Amen. (laughs) But today, I'm sure that there's some people that I'm talking to who are also disappointed with life, to the point that some of you might not even feel like celebrating Christmas because you're dealing with with problems, you're dealing with trials, you're dealing with disappointments in life, you're dealing with disappointments in your circumstances. And in this series, Don't Miss Christmas, we've been considering some of the real people involved in the first Christmas story who either missed or nearly missed the coming of Jesus for one reason or another. The greatest event in history was taking place, the coming of the Savior of the world. And these people missed it. They missed the opportunity to encounter Jesus. They missed the opportunity to experience the salvation that he brings, to experience the hope, the love, the joy, the peace that comes from him. And as we look at these stories, we discover that there are many things that can keep us from encountering Jesus and experiencing the wonderful life changes that take place as we welcome his presence into our life. We've seen so far in the previous two messages that busyness is one thing that can really distract us, amen, and keep us from experiencing Jesus. Last week we saw that self-centeredness can keep us from experiencing Jesus, and we have to dethrone self so King Jesus can reign on the throne of our heart. If you missed either of those messages, jump onto our Facebook page or our YouTube channel, and you can catch up on any messages that you have missed. But today, you guessed it, we're going to look at someone who almost missed Christmas because of disappointment. 
because of disappointment. Read with me, if you will, Matthew 1, and we're going to read verses 18 through 25. This is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. I want you just to kind of put yourself in Joseph's shoes and picture what's going on. Here's Joseph. He's, he's a righteous man. He's a man of God. He's engaged. And, and I'm sure that they had made all sorts of plans for their wedding and for their future together. And both of them had committed to keeping themselves pure. They were doing everything the right way, the way that we should still do it in 2022. Hallelujah, amen. That's an extra sermon, no extra charge. But they were doing everything the right way, God's way, keeping themselves pure. Or at least so Joseph thought. And then all of a sudden, he finds out that Mary's pregnant. And you can just imagine his predicament. You can imagine his disappointment. He, he must have been thrown for a loop to find out that, that, that Mary was not the woman he thought she was, or at least to assume that she was not the woman he thought she was. He, he, he must have been disappointed thinking that she had cheated on him and that all the plans they had for their life together were now turned upside down, disappointed and confused, trying to, to think about what all of this would mean for his life and for his future. Things back then were a lot different than they are today. According to the law of Moses, it called for anybody involved in sexual relationships outside of marriage to be stoned to death, both people. Even if they got married, the people would do the math in their mind. How many of you do the math sometimes? Nine. They got married in such as. Come on now, be honest. You all know. You compute the math in your mind. So even if they got married now, people would be doing the math in their mind, and they would figure out that this pregnancy occurred prior to marriage, and, and at the very least, Joseph and Mary would be scorned and shamed, and at the worst, they could both be stoned, as it would be assumed that they had sexual relations prior to marriage. Joseph was disappointed with the whole situation. He was probably disappointed with Mary. Maybe he was even disappointed with God. How could God let this happen to him after he lived righteously, after he did everything the right way? And now his whole life is turned upside down. His whole life is disrupted. Have you ever had something happen to you that way? Yeah. Here I am serving God, trying to do the right thing, and then all of a sudden out of left field, something comes and just throws everything upside okay. down. So all of these thoughts are swirling in his mind, disappointment, fear, confusion, uncertainty. And at night, he's probably tossing and turning. Anybody ever do that? Something's going on in your life and you just can't sleep, you're tossing and turning. And he's trying to figure out, what do I do now? What's the right thing to do? I love Mary and I, I, I don't want to publicly disgrace her, but, but I can't marry her under these circumstances. What's the right thing? What's the most compassionate thing to do in this circumstance? Joseph had a plan for his life. And this was not part of it. And in Joseph, I think we can all find ourselves at times in the Christmas story. Because there are times in all of our lives when our plans have been turned upside down by some unexpected disappointment in life. 
We found ourselves disappointment, disappointed with people we loved and trusted who did something or acted in a way that we didn't expect and adversely affected our life. Ever have that happen? You don't have to raise your hand, all right? You might be sitting next to that person. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> We may find ourselves disappointed with life's circumstances. How could this happen to me, God? I've served you. I've lived right. How could you allow this to happen? And so life's circumstances come, and we can't seem to see a good way out of this. Just like Joseph is trying to say, what's the good way out of this? Sometimes we've even felt disappointed with God. God, I've trusted you. I obeyed your word. I walked in your ways. How could you let this happen? Amen. Have you ever thought that? I put both hands up because we are human. And sometimes those thoughts come into our mind. Amen. We, we had plans for our life and whatever happened, this was not a part of it. And so, and so now you're hurting and you're confused and you're disappointed. And you may be even asking, where is God in the midst of all of this? Joseph's disappointment almost caused him to miss Christmas. And I'm not talking about the holiday. I'm talking about the coming of Christ. It almost caused him to miss Christmas or, or more importantly, to miss Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, and God's good plan for his life. But Joseph, as we know, was a man of faith. And by faith, he overcame the disappointment to discover the wonderful blessing that God had for him, a better plan and a better purpose for his life. Joseph's story will encourage us and help us to defeat disappointment that can cause us to miss Christ in the midst of all this Christmas activity and in the midst of our circumstances. It can, disappointment can cause us to miss Christ and to miss his good plan for us and all that he desires to do in our life. And as we look at Joseph, he teaches us several principles to overcome disappointment. First, faith sees God in the midst of our disappointment. Faith sees God in the midst of our disappointment. Faith overrides our interpretation of reality. There is what we interpret that's going on, and there's what God is doing in what's going on. Come on now, folks. Faith overrides our interpretation of reality. So as we see here in this passage in verse 20, it tells us that Joseph was, was considering the disappointing circumstances that he had suddenly found himself in. His interpretation of reality, Mary cheated on him. This uh, pregnancy is not his child. It's not his problem. He's got to find a way out. That's his interpretation of reality. And so he's giving careful thought to what he should do. And he eventually comes to the conclusion that the kindest thing, the best thing that he could do is to to privately break off his engagement. That might get him out of the hot seat of being accused of sexual sin with Mary, and, and it might give Mary the best chance to figure out a discreet solution for herself. So Joseph devised his own plan to get out of this mess. In his mind, it was the only logical thing to do. But then, an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph, and God gives Joseph a dramatically different plan. Joseph was going to do the logical thing. God comes and tells him something that is completely illogical. Mary is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. That's completely illogical. It does not uh, uh, accord with our human reason, amen? Amen. But God's plans are different than our plans. His ways are so much higher than our ways. Amen. So the angel appears and, and, and tells Joseph what's going on. And, and Joseph is instructed that he is to go through with the wedding. He is to take Mary as his wife and raise the child as his own. Now, Joseph has a decision to make. Does he hold on? to his interpretation of what's going on? Does he hold on to his plan to secretly break his engagement and move forward with his life? Or does he allow God's word to override his thoughts and change his interpretation of the events and go through with the wedding? He is at a crossroads that will dramatically change the course of his life. Whenever a crisis comes into our life, it is a crossroads. And the choices that we make in those moments dramatically affect our life moving forward. 
And for Joseph, only one decision, only one decision would lead to Jesus being in his life. You know, when we feel disappointed with life or feel disappointed with people or even disappointed with God because our life has been turned upside down, we too have a choice to make. We can continue to hold on to our perception of the events that what has happened to us has ruined our life, has turned everything upside down, that nothing is good in our life. Have you ever felt I don't raise your hand? But sometimes that's the way we become so negative because something happens that wasn't in our plan. And we think, oh, our life is so terrible. Oh, there's no way out of this. And we become so very negative. And we can continue to hold on to our perception of our circumstances, what has happened to us. And we can choose to wallow in discouragement, defeat, and doubt. Or we can choose to trust God, to trust that he has a plan for our life, to trust that he will not fail us, to trust that he will be with us and that he will bring us out. Hallelujah. Are we going to believe his word? Yes. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you. God's got a plan. And whatever just happened to you did not catch God by surprise. He's not up there saying, oh my goodness, I didn't know that was going to happen. I have to revise my plan. God knows all things. And he says, I know the plans I have for you. They are plans for your good and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. Hallelujah. So whatever bad, whatever disappointing thing has happened to you, God's already factored that in his plan. And if you will trust him, he will turn it around for your good and for his glory. Hallelujah. Folks, we may not be able to see it at the moment, but that's when we have to walk by faith. If you can see everything, you don't need faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So even though you may not be able to see God's good plan at this moment, that's when you've got to choose to trust him. To trust, yes, God, I know that you have a good plan for me and that you are working even in the midst of the circumstance. The choice to trust him is a choice to have him in our life. Because when we choose to trust him, that is when we can open our hearts to his presence and his work in our lives. When we choose to trust him, we will find that his plan is far better than anything that we could have planned for ourselves. Faith trusts that God is with us, even in the midst of disappointment. A part of God's message to Joseph as we read in verses 20 through through 24, is that all of this, all of this, he says, occurred to fulfill God's message through the prophets. What What is he telling us? God had a plan. He spoke that plan centuries before through the prophet. And all of this stuff that you're dealing with right now, Joseph, all of this disappointment that has turned your world upside down, that was a part of God's plan. It's happening to fulfill God's plan. Hallelujah. So he says in verse 23, look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Folks, when you understand that, then you understand the real meaning of Christmas. Jesus is Emmanuel. He is God with us. God loves us. Yes, hallelujah. Praise your name, Lord. God loves us so much that he doesn't leave us to do life on our own, to struggle with all the problems and trials and difficulties of life by ourselves. He doesn't leave us on our own. He doesn't leave us to bear the disappointment, the pain, the fear, the confusion all by ourselves. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Hallelujah. Even in the darkest times of life, he is still Emmanuel. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Hallelujah. You are with me. You are Emmanuel. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. So don't ever forget that whatever you're going through, and I know when you have problems in your life or disappointments in your life, The Christmas season can tend to magnify that and make feelings of disappointment and sorrow even more intense. But whatever you're going through, never ever forget 
that God demonstrated his love towards you by sending his son Jesus into this world in the flesh to dwell among us, to show us that God is not far and distant and unreachable, but he is right here, right here with us. Hallelujah. Jesus came to let us know that God loves us, that God is near to us, and that God is with us. You know, there are many times when we may be more aware of his presence, but when we have trusted our lives to him, he promises that he will never leave us nor forsake us. So even if you might not be able to sense his presence, that doesn't mean his presence is not there. It's just, you know, yesterday was cloudy almost all day long. How, how many of you know that? But you know what? The sun was still shining. And sometimes the clouds of our circumstance prevent us from, from seeing God with us, from sensing God with us. But that does not mean that he is still not Emmanuel, that he is still not there with us. Hallelujah. I heard the story of a little uh, girl named Rachel. She was a preschooler, and like many preschoolers, she had a problem waking up in the middle of the night scared and crying. And so the only thing that would soothe her fears was that she would come running and crawl into bed with mom and dad and sleep between them, and then she could sleep at peace the rest of the night. But mom had to go out of town for a few days on business. So dad came up with a new solution. He said, Rachel... While mommy's away, suppose I sleep in your room on the top bunk bed. And she thought, okay, daddy, that's a good idea. And so that night, Rachel went to bed right on time. A couple hours later, her dad crawled up into the top bunk, and she was still sound asleep. And she slept all night. She never woke up out of fear or nightmares or anything like that. The next morning, dad congratulated Rachel on having a full night's sleep. And, and she said, you know why, Daddy? It's because you were in the room with me. And her father said, but honey, how did you know I was there? You were asleep when I came in, and you never woke up through the whole night. And Rachel answered, because you said you would be there. I knew you were there. Hallelujah. God said, I will be there. I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. Hallelujah. So you can hold on to that even in life's darkest moments. He is with you. Hallelujah. He is Emmanuel. A second principle we learn from Joseph in overcoming disappointment is that faith trusts God when life doesn't make sense. And there's a lot of times when life just doesn't make sense. Your decision in disappointment will determine your outcome. When people disappoint us, when life takes an unexpected turn, it's easy to become disappointed, to become angry, confused, and even fearful. You are going to face times in your life where you don't know what to do. Just like Joseph was pondering, what do I do? What is the best way out of this mess? There's times when, when it may seem like this is a no-win situation. There is no good choice to get out of this mess. And that is where Joseph found himself. And God knew what Joseph was feeling. And God sent Joseph exactly what he needed. He sent him a message, a word from God in verse 20. Do not be afraid. You know, a lot of us, that's what overcomes us when, when life turns upside down. We're overcome by fear. And God is saying, do not be afraid. Now, someone has said that there are 365 do not be afraid in Scripture. So there's one for every day of the year. Amen. Now, I'll be honest with you. I've never sat down with the Bible and counted one, two, three, 300, you know. But I'm going to take their word for it because I know there's a lot of do not be afraid in Scripture. Amen. Because God knows that that's something we deal with. We deal with fear. So God sends him an angel, and he brings a message. Do not be afraid to take Mary for your wife, for the child that was conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. The angel goes on to say, all of this is fulfilling prophecy. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. 
which is God with us. Folks, hope is found in the word of God. If when we're going through those dark moments, those trying moments, God has already given us a message in his word. If we'll just take his word and we'll saturate our soul in his word, we're going to find hope because Jesus is our hope and Jesus is on every page of the Bible. And if we'll just receive God's message, we will find hope even in the darkest moment. Hope is found in God speaking into our life, the guidance that we need when we don't know what to do, the wisdom that we need when we just don't understand, the direction that we need to help us know the next step to take. When you lose hope, you lose perspective, you lose purpose, you lose joy, you lose peace. Joseph could have just rejected the angel's message. He could have dismissed it, disbelieved it. He could have refused to marry Mary and chose to follow his own plan to walk away quietly, which would have left his and Mary's reputation in question. He could have chosen to wallow in disappointment, confusion, fear, anger. But the angel provided a way of faith and hope, the way of trusting God, even when life does not make sense. And there are many things that happen in our life that do not make sense. But the one constant through it all is that we can trust God. He has a plan. He knows what he's doing. Hallelujah. 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 You know, the Bible says God is perfect in all of his ways. You know what that tells me? God doesn't make any mistakes. He's got a plan. He knows what he's doing. And I can trust him. But too many people, instead of believing God, they start blaming God. Not any of us, I know. Reach up and polish your halo. I'm talking about the folks at the church down the street. Something bad happens, and instead of believing God, we start blaming God. God, how could you do this to me? God, how could you fail me? I prayed and you didn't. We start blaming God. Amen. But instead, like Joseph, we need to choose to trust God even when we don't understand. When we choose to trust God, we will begin to see the wonderful plan of God unfold in our life step by step. The Bible says the steps of a righteous man are ordered by God. You know what a step is? It's the smallest progression forward that we can make. Some of us were waiting for God to show us the long-term plan. Ten years into the future, how are you going to turn this mess around ten years into the future? And God says, just trust me to take the next step. That's what he told Joseph. Don't be afraid. Marry Mary. Just take the next step. Don't worry about the rest of the stuff. Just take the next step. And I'll be there to tell you the next step to take. Amen? we got to trust God one step at a time. Your decision in the time of disappointment determines your destiny. Your decision in the time of disappointment determines your destiny. Corrie ten Boom, many of you might have heard her name. She's a a famous Holocaust survivor. She went through a lot of suffering. And she could have gotten angry and blamed God and become bitter when she found herself in a Nazi concentration camp along with her entire family who ended up being exterminated in the Nazi camps. But she trusted God. And he brought her through. And God raised her up to become an internationally known author, speaker, and evangelist. And she wrote this. When a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw your ticket away and jump off. You sit still and trust the engineer. She said, so it is in life. We can always trust God further than we can see. We may be only able to see what's right in front of us, but we can trust God for what's there all the way down the line. Amen? Solomon wrote, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Joseph at first was leaning to his own understanding, and he was trying to figure things out his own way. But when he got a word from God, He chose to not lean on his understanding, but to trust God. Amen? And God directed his path. Because Corey Ten Boom trusted God, God miraculously saved her from being killed in the uh, Nazi gas chambers. The morning 
that she was lined up and was supposed to be called to go to the gas chambers, somehow there was a clerical error and her number was changed for someone else's and God saved her life because he knew the plan he had for her. Her faith in the darkest of circumstances determined her destiny to influence the world through preaching a message of forgiveness and through her writings and the movie, The Hiding Place. If you haven't watched The Hiding Place, watch The Hiding Place. It is a powerful testimony to God. But Joseph's destiny to be the earthly father of Jesus and to be an example to us of trusting God in the darkness when life doesn't make sense was defined when he chose faith above fear. We need to choose faith above fear. And that is what opens the door step by step to God's destiny in our life. When we choose faith, even when we don't understand, even when we cannot see, each step of faith will take us one step closer to God's destiny for our lives. And God's destiny is always greater than our dilemma. What God has in store for you is so much greater than what you're going through. Look for Joseph. How much greater God's destiny was for him to raise Jesus as his son. Look at Corey Ten Boom. How much greater God's destiny was for her to raise her up as an internationally known evangelist and author. God's destiny for you is always greater for your, for, than your dilemma. There's always something that he is going to, to use as he lifts you up out of that situation. Oh, yes. He's going to use it for his glory. Oh, yes. But what I want us to see as we conclude is that Jesus comes into the midst of our disappointment, our confusion, and our fear. He is Emmanuel, yes, he is. God with us. And he invites us, regardless of what we're going through, to trust us. Trust that he is with you in the midst of the darkness of your circumstance. Trust that he has a good plan, even when you cannot see a way out. Trust that his way is the best way. Christ doesn't want to be just a concept, and he doesn't want to be relegated just to a holiday. He came near to us. He came down to us because we needed first to be rescued from our sin, but we also need his help every single day. We need his presence. We need his strength. We need his hope every single day. He came down to us so that we could know him, so that we could have a relationship with him, so that we could have hope and we could have faith through all of life's difficult circumstances. But we have a choice to make as a believer. In the midst of our disappointment, will we choose to trust him even when life doesn't make sense? Because your choice will determine your outcome and your destiny. And if you have not yet given your heart to Christ, you have a choice to make as well. Will you choose Jesus? Will you choose to place your faith in him as your savior? Because your choice will determine whether you will have Jesus in your life or not. Just like Joseph's choice determined whether he would have Jesus in his life or not. See, all of us are sinners. And the Bible tells us that sin separated us from God. But that's the whole reason that Jesus came from heaven to earth. That he lived a sinless life and gave himself on the cross of Calvary. He took our place. He took the penalty that we deserve for our sin. So that when we place our faith in him and repent of our sin, and the word repent simply means to turn away from. It means to make a U-turn. Repent means I realize I've been heading in the wrong direction. I've been living, God without, living life without regard to God, and it's taken me down a path to destruction. I don't want to live that way anymore. I make a U-turn, and now I'm moving towards God. That's what repentance is. And so the moment we repent and place our faith in Jesus, Jesus says we're born again. We're made spiritually alive. We are forgiven and we are brought into relationship with God. He as our father and we as our children. And that is the beginning of a wonderful lifelong relationship with God. 
And if you're here today or you're listening online and you have never placed your faith in Jesus, or maybe you did so many years ago and you've drifted away and you can feel God tugging at your heart saying it's time to come back, then I want to invite you to pray a simple prayer with me. And as you do, God is gonna do exactly what you ask him to do. Would you bow your heads with me? And would you say this simple prayer with me from your heart? Dear Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. And I believe that you love me so much that you died for my sins. Today, I confess that I'm a sinner and I repent. I turn away from my sinful life and I turn to you in faith. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins and I invite you to come live inside of me. Help me from this day forward to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, I want to congratulate you on making the best decision of your life, and I want to welcome you to the family of God. Let's give them a hand clap of congratulations. If you just prayed that prayer, uh, if we could get that screen up. Yes, we have that up. Uh, there's a, a number on your screen. If you would just text I prayed to that number on your screen. Online, you can type I prayed in the comments. And uh, we want to send you free of charge a little e-booklet that will help you understand the prayer you just prayed and how to keep growing in your faith. Because that prayer was a beginning, not an ending. And we want to help you to continue now in your relationship with the Lord and grow in Him. But in order to send you this little e booklet free of charge we need to have your email address so if you would just if you're here in-house text I prayed to the number on the screen online type I prayed in the comments a little later today you're going to get a response message with a link click on that link fill in your name and email address and we will send you this little booklet free of charge but in the meantime I want to encourage anyone who just prayed that prayer and all Christians to do three things regularly to grow in the Lord one talk to God every day that's what we call prayer amen he's our heavenly father and he loves to hear from us. He wants us to talk to him about everything. Amen. Start by thanking him about for the good things in your life because every good thing is a blessing from his hand. And then talk to him about whatever problems, difficulties, decisions you're making and ask his help. At a very basic level, that's prayer. So talk to him every day. Secondly, let God talk to you every day. And you might say, Pastor, how does God talk to us? There are many ways, but the number one way is through the Bible. That's his word, his message to us. If you don't have a Bible, download the YouVersion app, Y-O-U version app uh, from your uh, Play Store, and you can read. It's free. You can read there as often as you want for free, and I encourage you to start reading in 1 John. Just read a few verses, four or five verses every day. Before you read, ask God to help you understand what you're reading, and whatever you do understand, ask God to help you apply it to your life. Do that every day, and you'll start growing in your faith. And then the third thing, I encourage you to get connected to a local Assembly of God church. Of course, if you're here in South Florida, I invite you to come and get connected here at New Life. We have a wonderful church family that will encourage you, pray for you, and walk alongside of you. If you're outside of the South Florida area, then find an Assembly of God church near to you and get connected. Don't just attend services, but put some roots down. Develop some relationships there, because relationships are essential to our spiritual growth. You know, when a baby is born, God does doesn't uh, have us just throw them out on the street, right? They're born into a family. And the same thing is true spiritually. When we're born again, we're a spiritual baby, and we need a family to help come around us and help us to grow. And the church is the family of God. So I encourage you to get connected to the family of God. Amen. But once again, congratulations. For, uh, finally, I want to speak to believers, those who've already placed your faith in Christ. And I want to ask you, whatever you're going through, will you choose to trust God in the darkness? Will you choose to trust him when life just doesn't make sense? Will you trust his word and walk in obedience to him even when you can't see the way before you? Could we take a moment to commit ourselves this morning, whether we're presently experiencing disappointment or not, to say, God, I will trust you with whatever disappointments may come into my life. I will trust you when life doesn't make sense. And I will trust you in the darkness. If that's your heart's desire to make that commitment to the Lord, would you stand to your feet right where you are? And we're just going to pray a simple prayer, committing ourselves to the Lord this morning. You talk to him from your own heart, right where you are. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for each and every person that's standing to their feet right now, responding to your word and saying, Lord, we make the choice this morning 
that whatever comes our way, whatever disappointment, whatever difficulty comes our way, Lord God, whatever darkness we may have to walk through, we make the choice and the determination right now to trust you, Lord God to trust your word, to trust your presence with us, to trust your love for us, Lord God. We will hold to your hand, Lord God. We will cling to you in faith, and we will believe. We will believe in you, Lord God. Father, we make this commitment today, and we ask by the help of your Holy Spirit that you will enable us to live it out on a daily basis as we face the trials and difficulties of life. And may our lives be a testimony and a witness to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for joining us today. If you were blessed by this message, would you consider giving a gift to help support our ministry? You can text any amount to 954-516-1522. That's 954-516-1522. Thank you. And we hope you will join us again.